I really want to just sort of give you a flavour of the kind of teaching approaches we have at King's um, and, and tell you some marvellous things about um, essentially chem a chemical approach to the world. Um, and I, I guess I'd say something else in, in addition to what has already been said about why do a chemistry with biomedicine degree at all and why do why study at King's and that's really it's about food for your curiosity. So, if you are a curious person about the world, you want to know how the world works, it isn't just about getting a job. It's that that is an immensely satisfying thing to do. And it, in order for it to be really satisfying, you need to be with bright people who have got a similar curiosity about the world. And there are a lot of them here. <laughs> there are a lot here. And that's great. And that really makes life worth living, you got to me. <laughs> and that's essentially why I do it. Um, so look, here we go. Uh, this is something very curious. Um, you probably can't see it that well. Um, it's the world's lightest solid. It's 99.8% air, although it's a glass. And it's, it's a very odd thing. It's blue, but the reason it's blue is not because it's got any dye in it. It's because it's a foam. And the holes of the foam are so small that they refract light in the same way that light is refracted in the sky to make the sky blue. So this is truly a blue sky material. Now, does anyone have any idea? Um, what you would possibly want to use this stuff for, or what anyone uses this for, or why anyone would want to make this stuff. Anyone. <laughs> and you can just... It's a foam. You're not going to... I'm not going to ask you about it. Anyone. Anyone got it? It's a 99.8% air. No? Right, if I tell you that NASA are the main users of this material, is that giving you a further clue? No, it's not really fair. Oh, yes, you've got one of those. Come on. Say that again. Tiles for the space shuttle, but it is the best insulator on the planet. So that's a very good, that's a very, very good point. So it's a really great insulator. In fact, the other day I, did, I put a blow torch underneath it, and, um, and I put a flower on top of it, and the flower was fine. Then I put a chocolate bar on top of it, and the chocolate bar fine. The temperature below is about 1300 degrees. But the thing is, it's not got mechanical strength enough for that kind of thing. What NASA use it for is that they fly it around the solar system in big chunks the size of this table. And um, when small bits of dust that were formed when the, when the whole solar system was formed hit this stuff, they embed themselves in it. They're going, they're going point eight at the speed of light. So if, if you were to sort of try and collect them in a normal way with a sort of dustpan and brush, they'd just pass straight through or they'd burn up. And this stuff is a foam. So it, it, hit, it hits the first membrane of the foam, slows down a little bit, then hits the next one, next one, next one, next one. It's a bit like jumping off the top of a tall building onto a pile of boxes. In the end, you're fine, and the boxes are collapsed. And so that's, that's essentially what people use this very curious material for. But foams are interesting stuff. And I've got another foam here. Um, and you probably, can you, can anyone see it? I've got a little camera here, actually, so I'll, I'll let you have a look at this. OK. This is a cool toy as well. Uh, anyway, so here we go. Here's a foam. Can you see that? No, not very well. There we go. Aha, right. <coughs> Let's see that phone there. Anyone know what that phone is? I just made it actually. I made some more of it. There it is. Anyone? Come on. You can do it. <laughs> it's really an easy question, this actually. It is exactly what it looks like. Yes? They're bubbles. They're bubbles? And what, how, how have I made them? Where do you make bubbles like this in your life? This is washing up liquid, correct. <laughs> Actually, a rather brilliant piece of chemistry. And if we didn't have this piece of chemistry, has anyone gone camping without this stuff? It's hell. You have one meal, which is great, and then the rest of your life is hell. Because if you don't have dishwashing liquid, you are stuffed, really, in life. Your clothes are filthy, all your dishes are clothed, and you basically live a very mean life. Now, look, if I take this phone out of here... Uh, whoop, no, that wasn't very successful. Uh, let me get a bit more of it. And now we're going to get into biomedicine because, believe it or not, understanding foams and cellular structures like this is really you know, one of the key tasks for anyone who's interested in how the body puts itself together. Because the body is made up of cells and they're essentially bags of solid stroke liquid separated from other bits of bags of solid stroke liquid. And their interfaces are they're, well, they're sort of determined by physical properties. So you really need to understand how foams are formed, and that's what the people who made aerogel were able to do. They were, they were, they were making glass foams, 
but your body, you know, is, is a cellular structure. And so understanding cellular structures becomes really important. So this is, this is the fundamental physics that's right in front of you every time you do the washing up. You do the, and, or go and have a bath. And you think, well, okay, that sounds a bit slightly interesting. But let me show you something that's being done at Kings that really will blow your mind, which is another phone. Here it is. It looks actually just like a piece of medicine that someone might force you to take. It's just white. Um, and here's what it looks like under the microscope. Okay, so you can see that that's a phone. You sort of recognise it. But it's a solid phone, and it's called a piece, it's a piece of bioglass. And its claim to fame is that this material, if you embed it in the body, will turn into your bone. So if you're in a car crash and you smash your cheekbone or you break your arm, People can now MRI scan you, which you'll see in a minute, the MRI scanners. They can get the exact shape of your cheekbone. They can make this material, this foam material, in bioglass. They can implant it into your body, and in a few years, you will have a new cheekbone. That's just incredible, isn't it? And that is the future. Rebuilding the human body is, without a doubt, one of the biggest, going to be one of the biggest growth industries for the next century. Because that's what we want, essentially. We're getting older. And we want, you know, we want to live to 100 playing squash and tennis, don't we? And that you, break, you break a lot of cheekbones doing that at the moment, I can tell you. Um, now, why is it a phone? Anyone, anyone tell me why it should be a phone? You know, I just talked about a phone, but why should this be a phone? What's so useful about making this material in a foam form? I could just make a big, big bit of solid of this material. It doesn't need to be a phone. Why, why a foam? Anyone? Yes? Is it no density? It's what, sorry? It's low density. It's low density, yes. And, yeah, what is it about a phone's low density that allow, uh, would be useful for implanting the body? So I want to replace the whole, the whole of this. I want to replace with your, with you, your bone. So I need to get right to the centre. I need all, I need the blood supply to go right in the centre. So I need, I need a physical route from the edge to the middle, and that's what phones give you. So you can implant it in the body and, and, and your cells will infiltrate it, your stem cells will get right in there and it will rebuild your body. So, you know, although phones seem like a very trivial thing to talk about, and you know, we witness them all the time with things like washing up and in the bath, they're actually at the heart of what will probably be one of the most exciting um, industries of the next, well, definitely the next century, rebuilding your body. Okay, so now, I just want to, I'm going to just, this is just a bit of a summary slide because actually everyone else has talked in the same way, but I've, I've, I've put it in a different, slightly different format here. It's all about scale. So when you study chemistry, uh, well, so this is a slide of, I've, it's like the living, this is the living world here. So can you see that very well? Probably can't, can you? Let me just change the light. Is that better? No? Doesn't change it at all. No, it's worse. <laughs> That's worse, isn't it? Uh, okay. Oh, that's better. Okay. Right now. Now look, this is the living side of the world, and this is the non-living. If you, if you like this degree, I mean the whole point of this degree is to, is, to, is to jump across this divide, and to understand both sides of this divide. Now, I'm, I, I'm a material scientist, so I'm actually interested in, <laughs> I'm interested in all these scales, because essentially that's, that's kind of what I do. But if you talk about big things, so I've got, I've got 100 metres as a kind of scale at the top, and if you see this bar that goes down the middle, well, things get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So all of these scales exist at the same point of time in you now. You have all these scales in you. And all different things are happening at different scales. And that's what makes being alive so wonderful, but also makes the world a complex place. So at the top I've got a tree, and then you get a whale, and then you get a mouse, and as you get smaller and smaller, things, things get, they don't get any less complicated, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, so that's a flea on the mouse, and then if you zoom into that, you get the hair on the flea. And if you zoom into the hair, you find them quite complicated things, multicellular things. We're made up of tissues, actually, skin, our liver, our heart, all these tissues, lots and lots of cells. Foams, I give you foams. Anyway, no, not, they're not really foams, but they are cellular structures. Um, these are individual cells, and they just get, we don't know how these work. This is a massive unknown. This is one of the big frontiers of science. We know that they exist, and we know little things about them. But um, these are these are inside these. When you zoom in these, you find the complexity of cities. These things can change shape. They can generate energy. They can get rid of waste. They communicate within themselves and to other cells. And all of that's a very exciting area to be in. And down here, 
we've got the nucleus and DNA. And so that, that, in a sense, actually, we sort of know more about this area down here than we do about these scales here. Um, is that an overgeneralization? Well, maybe. Anyway, you can challenge me on that. Anyway, but, um, so, so that's the biological world. And now we've got the non-living ones. In a sense, the world that we've made, which is pretty incredible. So we made these enormous buildings. And we, we're making cars, huge cars, small cars, electric cars. That's going to be big in the future. And of course, it's an iPhone. So we've made these amazing little, um, you know, small things the size of a mouse, um, which can sort of communicate. And as you go down, so the animal world doesn't get any less complicated either. And, and we, as, as a sort of uh, set of scientists over the last 100 years or so, started to work out ways of manipulating these scales down here at different scales. And that's, that's been the key to a lot of the innovations you see. And I want to show you one of them. So um, I just want to show you. There's, there's something called a MEMS device, which, which, is the, which is the device that knows which way your phone's up. Then if you've got phones where if you turn it, the image switches and it knows which way it's up. Have you ever thought how that works? How does your phone know which way it's up? I'll show you. It's a very small, it's really trivial easy. I, I'm, it's, it's a mach little machine which I'm going to just use this much script to show you. I've got one in here. You've got one on your phone. If you've got a phone, probably anyone who's got a smartphone has got one of these things I'm about to show you in it. Um, okay, where's the, where's the... Uh, right. uh, okay. So this is, so you've got silicon chips inside your phones, and that's a pure single crystal of silicon, and a very pure it is too. And uh, there it is, that's a, that's a little silicon chip. See that, that thing there that, in the bottom? grey little blobs on it. The blobs are things because I haven't kept this under a vacuum. and uh, So that's, that's dust from my lab, I'm afraid. But um, see, see those things with horizontal lines? Those are tiny little man-made structures. They're mechanical structures that move when you turn your phone. And then you see how they're opposite. There's one, there's one running upwards and there's one running across. In fact, there's two sets of both. Now, they, each little line has a little electronic connection and it can tell how far apart they are from each other. And essentially, as you switch your phone one inside the other, these things basically get slightly closer to each other, and they, they change the electrical capacitance. And so your phone knows that. And I'm going to show you... Um, what am I going to show you? Oh, yes, I know. <laughs> I want to show you how small these things are. Because you just saw that, but see this picture of a flea? Well, it's a dust mite, actually. It was actually in the microscope, and... You see, it was running around these little things. There are also, these are also devices. See the ones up here? <laughs> well, that's the MEMS I just showed you. But down here are little cogs and wheels and things. So <laughs> we can now make tiny little mechanical devices that are as small as the hair on a flu. <coughs> it's pretty impressive. <laughs> I think, anyway. And that, that, that technology is the heart of a lot of very cool things that you, well, we all take for granted. Um, one of which is this. And it's a slightly bigger version of it. Um, okay, so this doesn't look very interesting. I'm going to show you this session on camera because you can't really see it. So manipulating the world in interesting ways is, is kind of a hobby of mine. Okay, so here's what I'm looking at. Okay, that looks like a piece of chain mail, doesn't it? Now, there are no joins in this structure at all. That looks impossible until you realise that this was designed in a computer and printed. So on that, we did that with the MEMS, those small devices I just showed you, but now we can do it with big things. So we can actually make things this size. As I was saying to you, um, you can print this in bioglass, right? So you can, you, can, you can make this as an insert into your body, but you can also make other stuff too. So this, is, this started off in a computer, and this is called um, rapid prototyping or 3D printing. And car companies are already starting to um, they're already starting to print cars. Okay, and that sounds weird. <laughs> and design a car and then press print. And the people who are really helping them this, with this are chemists, because to get this to work right, is to, is, is you need to understand the, the molecular level of this material, what you're, what you're putting down. And of course, you then need to make a big thing. So the name of the game in science at the moment is, is, is straddling these length scales and doing interesting things. I've got another piece here. Well, you can come and have a look at the end. There's lots of stuff. In case you thought it's just plastic, you can also do it in metal. So, 
So this is, um, this is a piece of metal that was printed in 3D. <laughs> it's even got a little internal staircase in there. Can you see that? Too? Yeah, that's... And uh, here's, here's one... Since I heard a gasp from the crowd, now you're really encouraging me. But anyway, here's one, this is one of the earlier ones. Right now, look. This is printed in 3D. It has moving parts. It has hinges. But these, weren't hinged, then these hinges weren't assembled. They were printed in the same way. So in case you're wondering how you print things with moving parts, it can now be done. The world is going to change. Um, anyway, so chemists, yeah, I mean, chemists are all part of this. It, there is really no way to do any of this technology without being able to link up these different lens scales. Let's say, good, I'm saying that it by, you know, by uh, chemistry and biomedicine hangs around down here a lot of the time. But as Roger was saying, in order to do anything significant, you need to know how what this stuff down here is doing up there. So these scales all communicate with each other. And you know this because when a gene turns on in your body, what it's doing is it's, it's down here, it's expressing a protein, it's changing some cellular structure. It's then changing the tissues, and you might be getting eczema, right? Or you might be getting some disease, you might be getting cancer, and you get bigger and bigger and bigger. These, these problems invade your, your body. But the other way around also works in life, which is that you go into an environment and that then filters down and turns the gene on. And what we haven't managed to do in the AI world is really make those connections very, very clearly, but that is where the big, that's where the big challenge is happening. So um, I don't want to go on too long because I know that we're, we're running over. I've got a lot of other things, marvellous bits of examples here. I'm going to just pick one more to show you and I'm going to rattle myself. No, I'm going to ask you which one you want to hear about. Okay, so you can hear about self-healing concrete, that's number one. Or you can hear about biomimetics, which is making materials based on biological structures uh, and doing cool things. Or, and that involves me hanging from the ceiling. Or, I don't want to bias you on this. Um, uh, or you can, um, oh yes, or you can have a look at a, a fluid that turns into a solid in a magnetic field. So this, just as proof I've got some, this is self-healing concrete, it exists, it works. What a weird world we're going to live in. But this is what I want to talk to you about. So, um, if you notice, if you look at the, at the um, animal world, things like spiders, <coughs> uh, like this spider here, okay, spiders, who's phobic about spiders? Anyone? Okay. Um, so these things, these things can climb up walls. They can hang upside down. You can do lots of kind of cool things. And flies can do this. Lots of insects can walk upside down on walls. Um, even small uh, animals can do this, like geckos. And the question is, how do they do it? How do these things cling to walls and walk upside down? I'm looking at the spider close up in case anyone really is afraid of spiders. Okay, so here they are. Now look, one thing you notice with this spider, well, what do you notice? <laughs> What's the startling fact about this spider or any other insect? Which is pretty obvious. Anyone? It's very hairy, yes. <laughs> and it's not, just, you know, it's not just a fashion statement. Um, those hairs are incredibly important to this, uh, this insect and all insects. And in fact, those hairs have hairs on the end of them. And it's these hairs that allow spiders and flies and, and even geckos, quite big things, to climb up walls. Um, and when you say why, well it's actually molecular forces. It's every, every atom, every molecule is attracted to every other molecule, if only they can get close enough. But usually, the, 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 the world of walls and things actually is very rough, it looks like the Alps. They're very hard to get good contact. And so what, what animals have done, or little insects, have, they, they develop very hairy structures, and the hairs go down inside into the, into the mountain ranges, and so they get very close contact. And because they get close contact, they use molecular forces to stick to the walls. So then you think, well, great, let's do the same. Let's make tape that uses the same technique. And here is some, what's called gecko tape, which is the first commercial version of this. This has got no adhesive at all. This is just a piece of rubber. But it's got, it's been, it's been um, manufactured to have tiny little hairs in it. And now it will stick really, really well. At the moment, the hairs are only one scale. So I was saying that there's multi-scale hairs on there. So it will stick only to, to things like quite smooth surfaces. But 
If I tell you it's sticking to this piece of glass and there's no glue there and it's infinitely reusable and it can be washed. It's, it's pretty cool stuff. And it's strong. Cue picture of me, not actually me hanging in this auditorium, but hopefully, oh, have I still got it? Okay, yeah, this is the new institute. There's self healing concrete, as, we, as I was saying. But uh, here, this is stuff called gecko which I'll just talk to you about. Okay, yeah. And there is me <laughs> hanging from the ceiling. So there's nothing underneath my legs there. Um, for a BBC TV program that we're making about these materials. And that is just a small bit, a small section of the stuff here. And it can take my weight. No problem at all. So that's proof that you are. It doesn't work. So, um, that's, I think I'm going to put, because we're running over time. There's lots more to say. But I would say this, that if you want to fuel your curiosity, then the Kings is a very, very good place to come.